From Pod News, welcome to Podland, the last word in podcasting news. It's Thursday, the 15th of September, 2022. I'm James Cridland, the editor of Pod News. And I'm Sam Setti, the managing director of River Radio. I'm Eric Newsom from Magnificent Noise, and I'll be on later to talk about audiobooks, podcasting, and all things listening. And I'm Alexander J. Newell from Rusty Quill, and later I'm going to be talking about audio fiction. Podland is sponsored by Squadcast, the remote recording tool that creators love. Squadcast has just launched version 5, with new features and a new look, and 4,100 hours of high-quality audio is remotely recorded every week using Squadcast. And we're sponsored by Buzzsprout, podcast hosting made easy. Last week, 3,421 people started their podcast with Buzzsprout. And now there's Buzzsprout ads to grow your podcast wherever you're hosted. Podland is where Sam and I review the week's top podcasting stories covered on Pod News. We support both transcripts and chapters, so you can jump to the part of this podcast that interests you the most. If your podcast app doesn't support transcripts or chapters, then grab a new app from podnews.net forward slash new podcast apps. Yes, and this week we've got more interviews than we've space for. So watch for a special extra interview edition of Podland on Sunday. We've got Dino Sophos, the brains behind The News Agents, which is a new news podcast from Global and many other things. And the return of Mike Caden from Red Circle with news about how their podcast host and monetization platform lets you sell your own dynamic ads as well. Those interviews in this feed on Sunday. I guess we'll call it a I don't know, Podland interview special or something like that. That sounds good enough to me, James. Good mm. to me. Let's kick off with the news this week. And we're going to start off with Spotify. First and foremost, Spotify is the top podcast network in the US based on research from new data from Edison Research. The mm. data measures total listeners to shows for each podcast, and it's for 12 months ending June the 30th. Is that correct, James? Is Spotify now the top podcast network? <laughs> is it correct? I think one of the questions here is, so we're, so there are three podcast network rankers in the US. One is done by PodTrack, one is done by Triton, and this one is done by Edison Research. The one done by PodTrack doesn't measure SXM Media, and nor does it measure Spotify. So it puts iHeartRadio at number one. The one from Triton doesn't measure iHeartRadio and doesn't measure Spotify, so it puts SXM Media at number one. But Edison Research, the way that this one works is that they ask 8,500 people a year, what podcasts have you been listening to? So they kind of uh, measure everybody. And um, iHeartRadio is at three, SXM Media is at two now, and Spotify is at number one. So is Spotify really the number one? Yes, I probably think it is. So all of these figures are for The Ringer and Gimlet and Podcast and Spotify Originals and all of that. Uh, archetypes, of course, will be in there as well, alongside Joe Rogan. And of course, the figures that we are seeing and the data that we're seeing is essentially data from the last year. So you can guess that there's been a little bit of movement over the last quarter in terms of that data. So take it as you will with a pinch of salt, but this is probably the most accurate is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it is the most accurate and I think it's worked out uh, pretty well. The great Tom Webster, of course, uh, was the original architect uh, of this, although no longer works for Edison Research. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting seeing uh, Spotify at number one these days. Spotify, as we know, are very heavily into podcasting. We've been waiting for a new UI because fundamentally the, the current UI is pants. And a um, friend of the show, Chris Messina, um, yes. has sent us some early screen grabs of what he says is the new UI. Podcast and shows as a separate tab within the new mobile client. Yes, and some people think this is a really good idea, that you have a view, if you want to, of just podcast and shows. But, of course, you also have a view, if you want to, of just music. And my uh, slight worry with this is that you will end up with people who just press the music tab and now no longer see any podcasts. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I'm not necessarily sure that it's a good thing. Would I be right or wrong in that? I'm on the other side of the fence. Sorry, James. I, I think it's great because I struggle when I use Spotify to to f clearly look at what I'm doing with podcasting. You know, I want... When I go into a, into Spotify and if I want to be in a podcast mode, 
I'm fully engraced into that mode. And mm. if I'm in music mode, then I want to go in there. And I, I feel like I sort of get a mismatch of um, everything coming at me. From what I remember, um, these are filters and not actually tabs. Potentially, uh, they could put more filters in. Um, no, I like it. I prefer it this way. If I'm being brutally honest, I think it's a cleaner way. Let's just keep podcasting in one space and music in another and never the two mm. shall meet. Well, I think it'll be interesting seeing what happens there. Um, they are doing some kind of weird and wonderful things with um, podcast artwork as well. There's a new sort of style for podcast episode art where they have the main podcast image in a tiny little sort of window at the bottom. And then the big uh, image is for the episode, which will look beautiful for this very podcast because we have separate episode artwork, but won't necessarily look beautiful for most of the other podcasts, which don't. And of course, Apple doesn't support um, episode artwork. So it's going to be interesting to see how that bit works as well. Thank God we're covered. Yes, uh, but yes exactly. Is this US only? Because I looked last night and clearly nothing has changed for me. Um, or is this going to be globally rolled out? Do we know? Um, I, I mean, my guess would be it will be globally rolled out, but it may well be, you know, in the same way that, um, you know, quite a lot of these things do where they launch with specific users uh, first. And uh, maybe that might start with the US only first. Yeah, I'm not seeing it either on my trusty iPod Touch where I uh, um, still have uh, Spotify installed. It's uh, off the Android device. It'll be uh, interesting to to see uh, how quickly they roll uh, all of this out. I mean, if you remember, they had this super-duper new view for podcasts. Um, what? This was um, six months or so ago, and they mm. still haven't rolled that out. So not quite sure what they're planning out there. Well, they're also going to be bringing audiobooks out, we've been uh, told by Paul Vogel, the CFO. He said that uh, audiobooks are coming to Spotify reasonably soon. don't know what that metric is, reasonably soon. Is that, as you just said, 6, 12 or 18 months from now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, who knows? I mean, 18 months is reasonably soon. But I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated with uh, how audiobooks are going to work in terms of uh, Spotify, because uh, surely they won't be able to offer them in the same way as they've offered podcasts and music of just, you know, here's your fourteen ninety nine bill. And mm. for that, you get all that you can consume. Will they? Is that how that's going to work? Well, no, I mean, I, I think you know, the way my Audible, I don't know if you have an Audible account, but the way my Audible account is, I have to pay a monthly fee, I get credits, uh, or I could pay a one-off fee for a book because it's a single item purchase. Mm. Um, so I, it must be an additional on-top payment to your subscription for, for whatever you pay for your Spotify, um, unless they're yes. changing the total model and then they've done an amazing deal, a la Steve Jobs. They've rolled in books as part of your subscription, which, again, I doubt very much, though. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a limit, of course, is in terms of how many audio books you can consume in a month. So maybe they might uh, work out that that's, that that's a plan. Who knows? If only we had someone who we could ask. Funny you mention that. I thought I'd reach out to Eric Newsom, who's the former senior vice president of original content at Audible. I asked him about what he thought about you know, Spotify getting into Audible books. I think that anyone bringing innovative ideas into any medium is healthy. I have always liked competition. It makes my blood pump harder. And you think of better ideas. If you're the incumbent and someone comes in to try to disrupt you, how do you respond? And that can be a really exciting problem to deal with. Everyone kind of equates audiobooks with Audible, which I think is unfair because there's so much else going on in the audiobook industry. There's a lot of a la carte sales that happen in the audiobook industry. But Audible is such a major force. And when someone comes into a legacy business and just does the same thing or repeats the same offer that somebody else is offering, it's very disappointing. And it's a wasted opportunity. Opportunity. So what I'm hoping when other players, be it Spotify or somebody else, comes into the audiobook space, like how can we create a paradigm that excites even more people about uh, spoken word or this form of spoken word being audiobook? How can we drag the publishing industry into the future with new ways of, of how to reach people and build relationships with consumers and yet still make money? I think there's very few potential disruptors in that space. So there's lots of ways that they could disrupt. 
And so I'm hoping that when Spotify comes into that space, that's the attitude they're taking. Because if they're just going to try to outprice maneuver Audible, whatever, cool. But the thing is, if you look at the audiobook audience, you see, if you look at all the literature that's out there about consumers of audiobooks and how much they listen, you see that it's a very different type of listener than you would see for music, definitely, and for podcasting even. You see there's that Venn diagram and there's that sweet spot in the middle where there's crossover in those audiences, but it's not as much as you think. You know, it's interesting. I've never thought of it this way before, but it's just coming to my mind of a lot of audiobook listeners, traditional audiobook listener came up because of a love of literature and a love of books. And a lot of podcast listeners came up through radio and an interest from that direction. And those are very different paradigms for listening as an experience. And you have the audiobook industry is basically broken into two groups. The much smaller are the people who are just large audio consumers. And those are the people who I think Spotify is going to be dealing with. And it's not that many people. And it probably is incrementally over who they have now. It's probably not as many as they think it is. Hopefully, I'm sure they've done their research. But the much larger group, which is going to be much harder for Spotify or any other entrant to get at, are those people who are genre listeners, who love romance books. I love business books. I like all these things. And they listen to just business books or just historical thrillers or just crime, true crime things. And they aren't looking for things outside of that space. That's their jam. That's their thing. And so I think those are going to be much harder for a Spotify to capture uh, or even start a relationship with. So if I was talking to Spotify, I would ask them, what are you really trying to accomplish? Are you just trying to look that this is a sector that you should be part of and there's a lot of money attached to it and you like money like most businesses do? And so you're trying to figure out how to have a role in that? Or are you trying to capture more of your audience's time? If you have a listener who does listen to audiobooks, they go to another app to listen to audiobooks, they come back to Spotify, listen to podcasts and Music, it, it depends on which paradigm they're trying to go for. It's going to be hard for them, and they're going to have to have a very good and clear strategy. And I'm not sure that given their entry into non-music categories, it's probably going to take a while until that kind of clear idea of what they want to accomplish emerges. Okay. Given your observation about the radio and the book paradigms, mm -hmm. what is the demographic generally of an audio book reader? Is it a plus 30 mainly female audience or is it a plus 50 male audience? What is the demographic generally of an audio book listener, would you say? It's one of the spoken word categories that if you look at some of the research from Edison and others, it's one of the categories that attracts more women than men. Most spoken word categories have traditionally appealed more to men than women. Uh, but the interesting thing as, you know, the, the, the boom that's happened uh, since the evolution of the smartphone in podcast listening and streaming and on-demand audio of all types. That has also fueled a tremendous amount of growth in audiobooks as well. That's not been just confined to the on-demand free audio or on-demand subscription audio. Audiobooks have also grown. And just as we've seen podcast listening and streaming democratize and look more like the audience in the, the territories that they serve, Audiobooks is also starting to see that same sort of reflection happening, where you're seeing much more presence of women and men in more an equal sense. You're seeing people from different strata economically, different walks of life. It just ends up becoming a much more reflection of the addressable audience than, oh, this is very techie and only these nerdy guys like you and me are able to access it. So therefore, the demographics look very different. I go back to something you said earlier, which was radio became an advertising medium that they would green light content to for the advertising. I wonder mm -hmm. if Spotify is going down the same route. So sub 25s are listening to Spotify. They don't listen to radio generally. That's a very sweeping statement, I know. But based on that owning a radio station as well, I can tell you that's the sort of demographics that we understand. Podcasting within the main, we've seen from the Edison research, was very male, heavily dominated for a long while. And it's now in the balance is being readdressed, which is why I asked you about the demographics of audiobooks, which I'd assume, maybe with no data behind me, but was more female because of what you said, which was it's more thriller, it's much more romance, it's much more book-led. Is 
Spotify just trying to fill all the demographic points so that its advertising strategy can then touch any point within those age ranges and genders. And is that what Spotify is now an advertising company, not a content company? It's a really great question. I'm not sure I have data to answer that. I think that rather than think of Spotify as an advertising driven company or a subscription driven company, I would choose to look at Spotify of like, are you in the listener business? Are you in the listening business? Are like asking them what business do they think they're in? And if that question is anything other than a user or a listener service business, then I think they're going to go the same way as all the others who have eventually found themselves in the service of solely advertising or predominantly advertising. We're in an era now where advertising has been on a roll for quite a number of years. And you and I both know that is much more cyclical normally and will become cyclical again at some point. Mm -hmm. And what happens then? Let's just take a quick break. Does news from the Middle East leave you with more questions than answers? What's happening? Who's who? How do they relate? And what does it all mean? Bringing you intelligent, critical insights every week, the new Arab Voice podcast untangles news and current affairs from the Middle East to North Africa and gets you to the heart of the story. Each week, we bring you the people in the know and the people on the ground who are living the story. The new Arab Voice, the biggest stories, regional voices and expert analysis. New episodes available each week on Apple, Spotify, Google and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Yeah, they've got their free model with AdLed. They've got their subscription model that I use. And then Mm -hmm. they've got their subscription model with ads injected still into podcasting i just wonder because obviously video is another form they're going into as well which again as we all know within the industry youtube is on the precipice of doing something significant but we never know when um i just you know throughout my entire career i've really tried to focus let's go where the listeners going and let's do things that excite listeners and one of my Many CEOs that I served with when I was at NPR, his last CEO I served with, his name was Jarl Mohn. He had an amazing career in media, and he used to always have a phrase that he would use that I rolled my eyes at at first. And then over the years, I found myself quoting it all the time, which is, nothing solves a problem like a hit. He's like, there are problems with business models, there are problems with relationships, there are problems with the ebbs and flows of business. But if you make a hit... A lot of those problems either go away or the options become much more interesting and you have much more opportunity to figure out what the options can be. And so his saying that implied focus on making hits. And I think that's wise advice that not many people in podcasting are taking right now because podcasting right now is a hand to mouth industry. People are like, I need downloads so I can get advertising and I just need to shovel as much cash into my mouth as possible. But they're not thinking of like very few, very few. I would struggle to think of anyone in the podcast space right now, which is thinking of like, what do we want to be three to five years from now? And how do we make decisions today that will put us to be the leader in the space we want to fill in three to five years? That's the type of thinking that is missing from podcasting right now for the most part. It's all quarter to quarter. How do we get next year's buys? How do we, even with the subscription things, like how many people do we get in? People aren't thinking about how do we care and nurture those relationships. And I I don't want to be too general. There are many people who are showing us great examples about how to think about relationships with listeners. And there's so much that can be learned from them. But I think the industry as a whole, especially the large networks and distributors, are thinking quarter to quarter. And I think that is a really dangerous place to be in. Apple, we haven't talked about them. They don't have an audiobook solution. Any thoughts on why that might be? They're a very disciplined company and they only go into things when they have a reason to do it and that they can make a significant presence in it. One of the things I admire about Apple as a company is they're like, unless we can come up with something that just changes the game, we're not going to do it. And it has to be a big change in a big game. People always ask, why hasn't Apple gotten into podcast advertising or taking you know, oh, podcasting is now congratulations a billion dollar a year industry and i think that's 
still too small to really catch Apple's eye. So I think they were just too small for the most part. And I think they take their role very seriously as a nurturer and convener of the podcast industry. And it has been since its very origins. But as far as like a business that they would be interested in, I think it's just not quite big enough. And so I think that's basically my thought about it is that they're a very disciplined company and they're not going to jump into something unless they can change it and they can make a substantial business out of it. There's no question they could change podcasting by anything they do. But can they make a big business out of it? I'm not quite sure it's big enough for them. Possibly. Now, magnificent noise is of podcasts. One of the things we talked about off air was the podcast index 2.0 namespace extending the metadata around podcasting, person, location, value tags. Where do you sit within that? Do you think it's a valuable way of moving the needle forward for podcasting and making it easier to discover and pay for stuff? Or do you think it's an industry distraction? So podcasting is moving at a tremendous speed. People come with lots of great ideas. So it's interesting. Our conversation has really been focused on surprisingly a lot on audiobooks and some of the business around podcasting, which is I don't spend a lot of my time thinking about these issues. I spend a lot more of my time thinking about how do we take good things and make them great, either through what we're learning from the audience we have or editorial instincts or like, how do we make something great? And that's where I spend most of my days focused around that. I read everything. I read all the newsletters. I read the things that come out in the mainstream press. But as far as like things, I'm going to stop and pay attention to this or this deserves more of my time. A, there's a small qualifier if I think it's big enough in, in, issue that I have to understand it in order to have a conversation with someone about their business. But for the most part, I try really hard to focus on what my kind of core principles of my business and my work are. And if some new idea comes in that makes that better, makes that easier, makes the connection have less static or less resistance in it, I think it's great. And I'm very comfortable with people experimenting with things and learning from them and not being the first one to rush in. When we started podcasting at NPR, we started in the summer of 2005. And this is after iTunes had made the announcement or Steve Jobs made the announcement of the integration into iTunes. It was after many large media companies already had a presence in podcasting. There were even NPR shows, which were distributed by NPR, but weren't owned by NPR, like those from WNYC, for example, who were already podcasting. And when we decided to enter into podcasting, the overwhelming response from within those inside of podcasting is day late, dollar short. You're too late. We've already started this space, but our approach was we would rather wait until this kind of establishes itself and then come in with something we think is a really smart idea that can move that space forward. And that's what the team did was let's come in, let's do our version of this. Let's not worry about what everybody else is doing, but let's pay attention to everything they've done and learn and then come up with a better version of this. And so I just keep doing that, whether it is different kinds of tagging or different kind of ad solutions or technology around podcasting. First off, I'm just inherently very skeptical of new technologies. And even though I have a lot of new technology in my life, but I wait until it's really established itself. But everything I ask is around, how does this make things easier for the listener? Not the business, the listener. And if you're like, oh, you can have a conversation with other listeners of this show, but you have to do it in my podcast app. That's not solving a problem for a listener. That's solving a problem for the network of the creator, right? Programmatic advertising. Does it solve a problem for listeners? Does it make advertising less annoying? Does it make it more relevant? Is the advertising itself better as a result of this? And unless the answer is yes to all those things, then I just don't give it a lot of credibility. I just let the listener be the guide. Technology is only good when it solves a problem and that problem can't be yours. Okay. I think there are elements in there, I won't go into it now, where I think cross-commenting and value for value will help listeners with interactivity and communication, but that's a longer conversation. My last questions are, how do you monetize your slate? How's your podcast production company monetizing? Is it through just producing for others or is it advising your clients as well on the best way to monetize their content? So the advice we give tends to be focused around portfolio and product. So if you are the XYZ media company 
and you have all these different things and you have no idea where to start in podcasting, believe it or not, those conversations are still happening. And we come in, or let's say you've had some podcasting efforts and you're not terribly enthused about what the results have been, or you just don't feel it's working right, or it's doesn't match your brand, or you're not making any money, we come in and we help you figure that out. It's very common for us to get brought in by large organizations or talent who are still trying to figure out, like, I can start a podcast tomorrow, but I don't want to just start a podcast. I want to start a podcast that matches my brand or is at the level that my brand should be at. So we do a lot of that work. And so that's just consulting for a fee, right? The production work is largely work for hire. So those are our biggest income streams. But as we've grown as a company, we've started to experiment with uh, making and distributing our own content. And that's been confined to just a handful of things so far. And they themselves are meant to be experiments. So we have a, a podcast uh, in the finance and business category called Bubble Trouble, which is really a very long, think about where you want to be in three years, like that, we have a trajectory of where we want Bubble Trouble to go over three years. And it's very modest. And it's very much like grow in increments and stages. We also have another show that we did that came out this year called This Is Dating, which was really an experiment. We complain a lot about the lack of innovation in the commissioning and green light space for new podcasts. We pitch a lot of podcasts and we see what people's reactions are to them. And it just got depressing. And so we're like, let's show that there's space for something that's more innovative and it's not a huge leap. Let's just do this. And so we as a company funded This Is Dating. Actually, I do a newsletter and there's one newsletter, which is just my co-founder and I talking about the process of coming up with This Is Dating. And put it out into the world to show the potential of how thirsty people are for innovative ideas. And this is dating is fun. Is it the most innovative thing in the world? No one's ever going to say that. But it is different. And it's created differently. It doesn't have a host. It's like all these conventions that we assume we deliberately walked in the opposite direction of. And that turned out really well. We did okay monetizing it. Not great. But the purpose was never to break even. The purpose was basically to start a franchise. And so that's definitely what we've done. I'm glad you said that you're looking to innovate because it does feel to me sometimes when I look at the Spotify or Apple charts or I look mm -hmm. at recommendations that everything's the same. It's another celebrity with another celebrity talking heads, inviting a third celebrity to a conversation or it's a sports person. Welcome to mainstream media. Why now, now podcasting is no different than every other media. Look at the TV charts. Look at what is popular in radio. Look at what's popular in movies. It's like the same type of things. But look at TV. Just look at TV as an example. That's a function of two things. The mainstreaming of podcasting is the main reason why. But another reason why is you've had so many refugees from other media come into podcasting, think it's an exciting space, and their first order of business is to make it exactly like the field they left, whether the business arrangements or the content choices or the approaches to the different types of talent you work with, green lighting processes, all of it is exactly the same as it was when they left TV and movie. And it blows my mind that people want to get away from a media, try something new, and then make the new media like the old media. That's very confusing to me. And I think nothing highlights that more than the kind of head-scratching interest that podcasters now have in video. That it's it's like video is the future of podcasting. No, it is. People who say that are fall into two categories. There are people who used to work in TV or people who sell advertising. Those are the two people or people who used to work in TV or wish they worked in TV and people who are in advertising. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to make your podcast into a video thing, great, do it, fine. But I think there's something important to remember about podcasting, and that is that it is predicated on the idea of listening. Listening is different than watching. Listening is stopping and letting something into your head a voice, an idea, a way of thinking that may be challenging to you, may be validating to you, may be calming to you, comical to you, moving to you. But that act of listening is something that will go away when it becomes a video-based medium. So people who want to make video podcasts, great. Many people forget that there were video podcasts before there was YouTube. Right? And just a lot of that energy went into YouTube. There's nothing wrong with it, but I don't think it's the future of podcasting. I think it's the future of something else. Before you go, please tell everyone where they can get hold of you. Well, I have a newsletter that you can get at audioinsurgent.com. It's called The Audio Insurgent. Magnificent Noise is at the very difficult to find website of magnificentnoise.com. 
And you can find information about Magnificent Noise, my newsletter and my book at ericnewsom.com. Eric, thank you so much. It's been very insightful. I've enjoyed it. And I'm finally glad we've met. So I uh, look forward to having a beer with you at the next event, though. That's something I'm looking forward to, too. The very excellent Eric Newsom. Who else have you been uh, chatting with uh, this week then, Sam? Well, yesterday I had the pleasure of meeting up with Will Page, who is the former chief economist at Spotify, lovely friend of the show, and Oscar Murray, the CEO and founder of Fountain. And we were talking about uh, books, music, and podcasting within the same application because we were mulling over the idea that podcasting apps, the the ones that support the Podcast Index 2.0, can use the media tag and support multiple different genres. Um, because my daughter will not use anything but Spotify. And her reasoning is that, well, I've got my music here and I've got my podcast here. Why would I go elsewhere and have a standalone app just to do podcasting? And so Oscar was mulling over the idea of, you know, hey, he, he may, there's no no announcement here, by the way, but it was a hypothetical. He may add music and books to Fountain. And mm. actually, then Will got very excited because then he was thinking, hmm, could we put a different revenue model? Because Will's view was that Spotify's ceiling, the fourteen ninety nine for family or nine ninety nine individual, was done decades ago, and they can't seem to move that price point up. But what if you then started a value-for-value value payment model? You could then suddenly have an elastic model of payment because it wouldn't be fixed uh, at the current pricing. You can see Will getting very excited about all kinds of conversations around economics and everything else. Um, but, uh, wow, wouldn't that be interesting if you had uh, Will and Oscar working uh, together on that sort of thing? Uh, that must have been fun. Yeah, the other, the other thing that Oscar mentioned I thought that was great was imagine being able to clip up, because Fountain supports clipping, uh, clip up sections of books to share with friends or or clips of music that you want to just say, hey, this was a really great intro, or why don't we, you know, have you heard this track and here's a bit of it. Um, I think there's lots that could be done if, you know, any podcast app, and not just Fountain, could mm. aggregate books, music, media, even video. And the nice thing about it is, as you know, James, the Podcast Index already supports this as a uh, mechanism. Let's just take a quick break. Hi, I'm Sanjay Park. I'm the guy that invented IP address location technology. So when you can't watch your favorite streaming service when you're traveling, sorry, that's kind of my fault. And I'm Adam Walker, a serial tech entrepreneur and tech news junkie. Each week, we read tons of tech news so you don't have to. We host the Tech Talk Y'all podcast, breaking down the week's tech news with a lot of laughs mixed in. We also talk about weird and wacky tech news and wrap up every episode with tech recommendations we're sure you're going to love. So subscribe to Tech Talk Y'all today and keep up with all things tech. Do, do, do. Indeed, it does. Absolutely. And uh, perhaps now's a good time just to remind you, if you get value from this particular show, then you can always pay that value back by hitting the boost button in your favorite podcast app. Uh, if it's got one, if if not, podnews.net slash new podcast apps is where to go to find one with that in there. And we really appreciate that. We'll get on to some boostergrams uh, later on. Now, let's move on, shall we? Let's move on to audio fiction, because um, audio fiction, we're always told, is the next big thing in terms of podcasting. But I was um, quite curious as to how the business works and how easy audio fiction is to monetize. So I wondered, who better to talk to than Alexander J. Newell, who's the CEO of a successful audio who's the CEO of a successful audio fiction podcast company called Rusty Quill. We are a combination podcast network and production house, and we specialize in audio fiction. It's not all that we do, but it is most of what we do. So if it is genre fiction in the podcasting space, we are either making it or we're probably talking to the people that make it to see if we can't collaborate on something. We were founded in 2015, and in that time, I think we've hit to public at least more than 25 shows but we, we're constantly adding new ones both originals and network partners so 
don't quote me on that exact figure so it's because it's probably shifted by the time this uh, airs tell us some of your big hits the podcasts that we would have heard of the one that's probably the most popular is the magnus archives the magnus archives a weekly horror podcast by rusty quill it is a uh, horror a- anthology ish in that it gets a bit more complicated but that's sort of part of its charm and um that's probably our most popular that's uh that was oh i'm trying to think now that was launched around 20 2017 2018 something like that 2017 that came off the back of our first show which was called rusty quill gaming okay hello and welcome to episode one of the rusty quill gaming podcast which was an actual play podcast with improvisers and comedians and so on that was the biggest in the uk of its type and then uh, grew a bit from there So why audio fiction then? I mean, you know, there's lots of different genres there. What made you think in 2015, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to launch a company and it's going to focus on audio fiction. What was the fascination there? Yeah, I have to admit, at the time, it was even more niche than uh, what it's uh, grown into. I personally have a lot of background in theatre, in comedy, stuff like that. And as a result, the first show was actually the uh, the gaming one, which is sort of uh, semi-audio fiction, but it does have uh, improvisational and chat elements. But back at the time, it was mostly... It's, it's not a very particularly inspiring answer. Market analysis, it was looking around and going, in the UK, there's not many people doing the actual play. Uh, we'll do that, but we'll do it better than everyone else. And then we poured the time into that, and then we reinvested and doubled down on audio fiction. Um, the reason that we've stuck with it, though, is it actually ticks almost all of the boxes for like uh successful podcasting so to dive into that a little bit it's evergreen um a story is still the same story later on so as a result you get a lot of people go back and listen to the whole thing also you get a lot of transference between shows so for instance if you were doing a a, an economics podcast and you were doing a podcast reviewing food the, the cross pollination between those audiences can sometimes be a bit low but for Mm. fiction oddly enough even though it seems disparate to compare a a sci-fi comedy over here with a a historic drama over here interestingly we see a lot of audience transfer between these different points because ultimately the people here like storytelling and as long as you are hitting that quality Mm. marker um you'll get that transference the most important thing for a fiction is that it ends um which obviously is like anti-normal podcasting is you kind of want that thing to roll forever but for fiction there's there's a sort of critical mass where if your story doesn't end people are like okay this is kind of, you're kind of you're drawing this out now this is like lost season 57 we're, we're, we're done so yeah. you do have to keep creating new shows for fiction you can't just sort of make the one and live on it forever it doesn't really work like that so does that make it harder to earn money out of audio fiction i'd actually argue the opposite at scale um so it's very very difficult to make money in audio fiction if you make your tight little six-parter and leave it at that um because yeah podcasting we all know it's a bit of a war of attrition you need to hit that number of episodes but when it comes to the um the longer running stuff you you get you get runaway conversation you get a very good organic growth from audio fiction because if people like a story they want other people to come and listen on the story so they can start talking about it and things like that and it can grow the catch is yeah that scale is you need to be able to finish a show and already be working on the next show you can't sort of make it package it leave it there and then just sort of get rich it it doesn't work like that you you do still need to hit those downloads but what you can guarantee is that people will move between fictions um, so that's the way that you sort of make it and you make it balance. So how do you earn money out of all of these things? <laughs> I get asked that question a lot. Um, so audio fiction lends itself quite well to a couple of specific revenue streams. Um, first things first is your standard dynamic and programmatics tend to do very well, actually, on audio fiction because people binge the whole thing. So as a result, you'll, you you sell a lot of ad space because it's rare that someone will just listen to the most recent episodes. They tend to go back and they want the whole story. So as a result, you actually get a, a healthy, in, almost inflated um, amount of ad slots in a good way where they, they are getting used. Um, but in addition to that, engagement tends to be very, very high in fiction, disproportionately high compared to pretty much every other type of uh, podcasting I've come across. So as a result, um, merch sales tend to be a lot higher for fiction. Partnerships tend to be a lot more lucrative as well. People want to buy the game based on the characters that they love. And the last one, which is the sort of elephant in the room, is it's 
it's not a secure, and I would not say that it is a guarantee, but uh, intellectual property derivatives obviously are a lot more robust in audio fiction. Um, so I, don't get me wrong, I am not saying, cool, go make audio fiction and then you will have an Amazon show. It does not work like that. Mm. But it is still an additional option that isn't really on the table for other types of podcasting. Whereas here, you can make something and you do get the knock at the door of, I want to make the film of this, or I want to make the TV show of this, or, you know, I want to make the MMORPG of this, whatever. Like, you do tend to get more approaches because it's fiction. So, as a result, um, the extreme long tail of derivatives is a, is a lot healthier in fiction. But yeah, day-to-day BAU, it's that you can sell uh, dynamic and programmatic and uh, sponsor ad reads very effectively in audio fiction, because the earlier episodes stay relevant perpetually which is a a huge advantage so as a result audio fiction tends to per show actually be quite lucrative compared to say chat content where you have to run a long time before that attrition starts to kick in and in terms of brand safety and things like uh, that, I mean, obviously, audio fiction, you know, there are uh, uh, motor chases and people die and, <laughs> you know, and all that kind of stuff. D- does that cause problems with the automated brand safety tools? Really good question. So there's been a lot of shifts in that element uh, of the of the dynamic advertising environment recently, which we have to keep a, a close eye on. Um, so far... I've been pleasantly surprised at how uh, that uh, detection has worked. So you haven't fallen foul of it too much. They can put a little marker and be like, okay, yeah, we know this isn't about cars. We'll we'll stop doing cars on your ghost podcast or whatever and make sure it's horror stuff and things like that. So yeah, you can get the odd sort of false positive. Um, but generally speaking, I've been surprised that it's it's a bit more robust than you might think, um, which I suppose could be terrifying if you're if you're worried about robot overlords. But it it serves the uh, industry okay at the moment. <laughs> now you you have a um, you have a very good uh, North Midlands accent um, and uh, <laughs> from the UK, of course. And the UK is an interesting market because you still have fiction, audio fiction on the radio. Uh, in yeah. terms of the afternoon play on Radio 4 and in terms of what's mm-hmm. available on the BBC Sounds app. And that's pretty mm-hmm. unusual for a radio market. I wonder whether you see any differences between the UK audio fiction market and, let's say, uh, places like the US or Australia where audio fiction really isn't uh, something that people are actually very familiar with. Uh, yeah, massive differences. You're, you're right to home in on that um, as a as a market difference between them. Um, the odd thing is it's actually more similar than you'd expect because of one simple fact which is although I would argue and this is speaking anecdotally that your average British person is going to be more likely to be more familiar with the concept of audio fiction like you say thanks to things like Radio 4 etc the ultimate truth is is that there's still a sort of element of they're not necessarily aware of it in podcasting and things like that The, the interesting ones that you homed in on though are um, from our perspective, uh, Nordic regions, Canada uh, and Australia tend to be very interesting on the audio fiction side in that a lot is actually being produced. But what's interesting is it seems to it seems to lock quite regionally. So the US and the UK has a lot of cross pollination in that, like, if you make a UK show, it tends to go down well in the US. Um, it's just so Britishy. And similarly, on the US side, um, it, it comes across <laughs> onto the UK side because there's a lot of there's a lot of that kind of uh, bleed. Canada's an interesting one. It's a difficult market to break into because audio fiction in Canada is very well received, but Canadian audio fiction tends to go down very, very well and it's it's more difficult to break in from the outside. Yeah. Whereas Australia definitely as a market skews towards comedic fiction. Uh, and if we're getting really technical, it's a different style of comedy than, say, British or Northern US. Um it 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 has a more Let's just say it has a more specific skew. So as a result, it's quite difficult to make something that appeals to all of those markets equally. Sometimes you'll have to say, right, this story will go down well in this region, but in this other region, Mm. we we can't assume it's going to go down as well. And you you kind of balance against those different regions. And of course, the Fable and Folly um, podcast network in Canada is a tremendously uh, large force in terms of um, fiction podcasts 
podcasting in that uh, in in that country as well. T- tell me a little bit more about the um, the company. Do you have lots of people who are just sitting there waiting to make great audio, or how does it work from a um, from a people point of view? Basically, we ripped off a number of production um, models from different industries and combined them into something that's uh, a bit more efficient for podcasting. So for anyone who really wants a deep dive, we began by using, uh, we call it the Pixar model, which is you hire your creative team. Uh, and then once, say, the writers have finished working on that project, ideally, you try and get those writers, pair them with some new people working on the next project. Meanwhile, while they're writing on the next project, the um, performers are getting recorded um, and then once those performers are recording, the director's done, you get the performers working on the next project. So you start staggering these things out so that ideally what is happening is you have a launch. And while that launch is running, you're already finishing up the next one and so on and so on. But ultimately, as we expanded, we we hit the point of needing to do a multi-strand uh, tactic. So rather than sort of releasing these in single file, it was a case of, OK, we'll, we have our A team and then we have our uh, our team one, let's say, and then we're running them parallel to one another. Uh, and you you start staggering it out so that each of these teams are staggering work, but you have multiple strands releasing simultaneously. So I think at one point we had uh, four or five originals sort of landing all on separate days of the week, but offset with one another slightly. So in terms of your uh, shows, um, what's the next big show that you have uh, coming up? And if 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 I've never listened to any audio fiction before which audio fiction podcast it might be yours it might be somebody else's would you recommend so at the moment we're literally mid-launch of our newest show which is called trice forgotten rusty quill presents trice forgotten premiering august the 2nd 2022 wherever you get your podcasts It is a found family pirating uh, adventure, which is uh, led, created by uh, a person called Nemo Martin. They are very good at what they do, uh, and that is it's only a few weeks in now, but that's going that's um, going down quite well. We also have another one launching mm-hmm. comparatively soon called Cry Havoc Ask Questions Later, which is a uh, ancient Rome comedy. We're going through a bit of a, a, a historical bent uh, kick for the for the next few months. But in terms of <laughs> yeah. what would I what would I recommend? Almost always what I'll do whenever I'm asked that question is, well, what's your favorite story? And then I'll find them an audio fiction that pairs well with that favorite story. You know, like like cheeses and wines. But if I had to pick a generic sort of like go to um from our own, I tend to recommend uh Magnus Archives because it starts in a more familiar format. It feels quite like an audiobook. Um, in that it's, you know, begins with single narrator and it narrates it out and it's a very easy transition. Hello? Hello? This archive is off limits. Is anyone there? Martin? Martin, is that you? And then it starts hmm. becoming ensemble and full immersive audio and blah, 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 as it, as it grows. So as a result, that can sort of lure hmm. people in. Well, uh, I will put links to all of those in the uh, show notes. And uh, Alex, where can we find all of the shows that you're currently working on? Standard phrase, you know, it's all available on the podcatchers of your choice. Uh, but if you head to rustyquill.com, <laughs> um, you'll find links to all of the RQ Network shows on there. That contains show information, credit information, basically everything that we do is on there. That's probably the easiest way, but you can just find us anywhere that you look for podcasts. Alex, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. No, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, I hope we get to speak again soon. There you go, Alex uh, from Rusty Quill. Yeah, very interesting. Audio fiction's not my genre, but um, uh, again, I can see why it's growing rapidly, though. Mm. Yeah, it's not mine either, but I really like the the way that he talks about basically planning ahead so that your people are always busy producing something and basically um, adding to the body of work that you have out there. So that was um, that was all interesting stuff. Right, uh, time to uh, get some tech stuff, I suppose. Yeah, um, one of the companies you wrote about this week was uh, Balcoa. I, I think that's how you mm. might say it. Uh, which claims it's a new decentralized podcast platform. Now, uh, apart from rolling my eyes initially, I did actually go and have a look under the hood of yeah. what they were actually saying and doing. 
And actually, if they deliver on what they're saying, it could be a very interesting system. Basically, they're using the IPFS uh, blockchain uh, database system for, so they're allowing people to write to a database and decentralize it. From my point of view, so it uses Ethereum, TIC, uh, it, it'll use a web DAP, hooray. Um, it, it's got tokenized communities. Uh, it's it's just like basically, you know, um, if if this was a drinking game, I'd be I'd be drunk by now. Um, yes. But um, so is the plan that it's a it's a new podcast hosting company, which is sensor resistant, or is it a new podcast directory, or is it a bit of both? And then it's got subscription memberships and that type of thing. What what what's it actually trying to build? I'm not sure. In initial viewing of it. It looked Mm. like it was a directory. Uh, It could be a host, as you just said. Um, I was more curious about the micropayments for your content offerings based on the fact that it was using Ethereum. So it would have to use ETH to do that, and I'm not sure how you would do that. Yes, and I think that the costs for doing that are quite expensive as well. I find it – I always find it amusing when you have a company which is announcing a decentralized platform – um, who posts their main uh, blog post about it on medium.com, the very opposite of a decentralized platform. And I'm there, there thinking, really? Um, but still, uh, there we are. It'll be, um, uh, yeah, interesting to uh, take a peek uh, at that. Um, you can uh, find that uh, linked in our, our show notes, uh, of course. Uh, as indeed, you can find the Podcast Index website linked in our show notes. Um, they are going to do some um, uh, interesting tech work in the background they're no longer going to store any email addresses anymore um, so that instead of storing the email address it'll store a hash of that so you can still log in uh, if you want access to the API and all that kind of stuff um, but the system won't ever have a clue um, who is actually logging in um, uh, in terms of an email address there won't be an email address shared in the database and I thought oh that's an interesting idea maybe I should do that on pod news and then I thought no because I need to send people emails um, so uh, no we won't be doing that but I thought that that was quite a nice thing that uh, Dave Jones announced um, listening to the podcasting 2.0 uh, podcast last week mm. he's also still very keen to get the verified tag working as well so um, yes I think this is all part of that verify tag um that you, I, Alberto, and a few others were talking about at Podcast Movement back in January. Indeed, January. yes, it's, uh, yes, we haven't haven't moved uh, much from that, have we? No. Um, but yes, it would be nice for that to get uh, sorted. Um, iOS sixteen is out. Uh, you and your play phone have you uh, have you installed <laughs> iOS sixteen yet? Yes, James. I I had it loaded one hour after uh, it was available. Uh, but um, of course, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you were you were saying uh, a couple of weeks ago, James, that you know it would be a, a lovely new uh, large graphic on your lock screen. And um, hey, presto, there it is! It looks very pretty. Uh, the graphics stand out. Uh, you've also got a nice little widget below it, so that you don't have to open your phone and go in to change the volumes or move forward and back. Um, yeah, I mean, it's nothing, nothing that's going to change your life, but it's just a little bit prettier. Mm, I was getting very excited. Uh, I was uh, there stabbing the uh, the system update button on my uh, iPod Touch, uh, waiting for iOS 16 to drip down to it. And I got uh, an exciting update and I thought, oh, brilliant. And uh, yes, it's updated me to iOS 15.7. Oh. And then I thought to myself, hang on a minute, and went online. And of course, iOS 16 isn't supported on this. So um, I now have no way of checking any new iOS apps. Um, so great. Um, so I'm not quite sure what I'm, what I'm going to do now. Can I just say, ho, 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 it's Christmas coming? <laughs> well, ho, 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 it's Christmas coming, yes. But I mean, uh, would that be buying a phone? Well, what do I want with another phone? I've got a phone that works perfectly happily. 
You can have Dynamic Island then. You'll be very excited. <laughs> Dynamic Island. <laughs> oh, dear. Dynamic Island. Uh, the one thing that uh, if you are um, uh, a app developer on iOS 16, one of the things that you should be doing is just uh, supporting uh, that new user agent in Apple Core Media. So you're no longer using Apple Core Media basically as a user agent. And the figures for your app will go up. Uh, so you should most definitely be be doing that too. Um, mm. You write something about a Mac um, app called Podcast Studio app, which I've never heard of before. Why is this exciting? Well, you know, it just it just appeared as a new available app. They've added support for Buzzsprout, which I thought was interesting. So you can record I've heard of them. edit. Yeah, yeah, nice boys those. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've, they've added support for record, edit, and publish directly to Buzzsprout, which, you know, obviously piqued my interest. So I went and had a look at who they were. It never crossed my path before. Uh, and it's available on the Mac store. You can try it for two weeks. Uh, it also supports Captivate, Blueberry, Libsyn, Podbean, Spraker, um, et cetera, with, as it says here, single click publishing. Um, I haven't tried it. Um, I just thought it was a nice thing. It's a, a native app for podcasting on your um, desktop. Yes, it looks nice. Um, also, uh, Podverse Web now has uh, translations into Portuguese as well, which is nice. It's always good to see more translations being done. And there is a, um, there's a website that I discovered called Send to Pod, which is a very strange-looking website. It takes um, long web articles that you're too busy to read uh, and basically uses an AI voice to turn them into an audio file, which you can then import into your podcast app, um, which uh, sounds like an interesting plan. Um, it's also incredibly expensive as well to use. And my suspicion is it's incredibly expensive because the APIs that he's using are incredibly expensive. But, you know, like 20 cents an article to listen to a podcast app does not seem to be a particularly good plan. But still, but there we go. Uh, at least it's a new and an interesting idea uh, that interfaces with uh, with uh, podcasting. So can't can't be all bad. Yeah, and I tested the WordPress uh version where you could actually uh, have your blog posts translated to uh, a audio file and and that works very easily so i'd mm. probably stick with something like that but there you go <laughs> mm. nice of him to try something new um let's move on james uh let's have a look around podland uh, and see what's going on around the world um in dubai the arabic podcast network asphalt how do you say that so as your arabic Sout, I believe. Sout, okay. Uh, uh, has acquired the Dubai-based podcast production company Finyal Media. Yes, lots of exciting things going on in the Arab world. I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, in India, Ghana, which has been historically one of the larger podcast apps and podcast platforms, they are not in a good state. They're owned by Times of India Group, as I understand it, and Times of India Group is, at the, is in the process of splitting up. And they, Ghana, have tried to merge with a big telco. So in just the same way as um, Sarvan is now owned by Geo Reliance, uh, Ghana will be owned, uh, or Ghana would have been owned by one of uh, their competitors. But that failed. And basically, the company has gone, oh, we don't know what to do now. And we're stopping access for free users, which sounds, you know, well, you know, the, the way that quite a lot of these uh, music services and podcast services work. But unfortunately, India being uh, the economy that it is, fewer than 1% of Indian audio users actually pay for audio entertainment. Um, so Ghana is going to have a scary couple of months, um, assuming that it uh, finds another uh, buyer. So interesting stuff going on uh, there in uh, India, certainly. Yeah, just a little tidbit. Ghana means song in Indian, just in case you want to know what it means. Oh, I did, I did not know. Well, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Back to the UK. Uh, the Audio Production Awards has announced a pay-what-you-can scheme. Uh, which is sponsored by Amazon Music and Wondery. Entrants and attendees who would otherwise be unable to enter can choose to pay what they can afford. This is a value-for-value value payment system, I guess. Yes, uh, almost is, isn't it? And talking about awards, the Australian Podcast Awards are open for entry, mate. 
uh, in Australia, the country's most prestigious and well-recognized podcast awards. It says here, uh, the judges had more than a thousand submissions in 2021. So if you are in in Australia uh, and you think that your podcast is award winning, then uh, by heck, you should be entering. Uh, you'll find it at australianpodcastawards.com probably. Are you a judge? Uh, I'm not a judge. Um, I've just been asked to judge in another awards, which I don't think the awards are actually um, public yet. Not two million miles away from Australia. Uh, I'm not a judge in the Australian Podcast Awards, and actually haven't been over the last couple of. Oh no, I was. I was a judge last year, I think. Actually, more than the way that I think about it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's always good to be a judge, but always quite a lot of work because you do have to listen to them all. Uh, so that's always uh, always worthwhile bearing in mind. Now, in other news, uh, podcast discovery tool Good Pods has launched a website. The website includes charts, user reviews, and supports episode images. Um, I had a quick look at it. Looks very nice. It's not finished yet. They say that at the top they'll be adding more features. Yeah. Why have they moved to a website solution? I think they're adding a website solution more than more than anything else, but um, uh, making that available um, so that you can uh, have a good um, look through uh, the particular good pods, um, you know, thing on there as well. We have ten. Uh, ratings in good pods. We have two comments, one from Claire Sandys, who says, great way to hear experienced perspectives on all things podcasting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire. And something else from Carissa Flocken, uh, who has just given us five stars. So Carissa, thank you very much for that. Our score is five stars in there in total, uh, which is uh, nice. But no, it's a good looking, um, it's a good looking site. Uh, it works well. It's very responsive and everything else. And you assume that, you know, at some point they may focus a little bit more on the website. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I'm not quite sure what the long term future of the app is, if the website is going to be as fully features as it as it currently is well talking about long-term view what is the what is the overall goal for good pods i mean what what's uh, are they pod chaser like i mean i don't really use them um yeah i, I, I mean i i think from a uh, from a point of view of what they are aiming at they're aiming at something which is a very uh, social experience. So you can see who your listeners are. You can see who your friends are on the system and what they're listening to. So you can be, you know, re re recommended, you know, um, to that. So, you know, uh, I, we can see uh, we've got 20 listeners on the Good Pods app who have clicked the button and subscribed. Um, and I can see Alberto from um, RSS.com. I can yes. see Ariel Nissenblatt. Uh, Matt Medeiros is in there. Norman Cheller from um, from Podchaser. So a bunch of different uh, people. And yeah, I, th I, I think it's just a nice social experience, which also is there to promote the fact that it's um, a very, you know, indie friendly um, podcast app not that much stuff in terms of the new podcast namespace quite yet though that's the one thing that i would say but we are number four in there in the top 100 tech news chart keep keep rating we might go to number one now yes um i'm going to say it as gramophone it's spelt differently but i'm going yeah, to call because it it's gramophone. The internet, isn't it gramophone yes. But yes. yes, it's a it's a magic new tool which um, allows you to do live streaming straight into TikTok. Uh, you liked the idea so much that I believe you used it, didn't you? Yeah, I we've been looking at ways of trying to get into more TikTok. I think Ariel Nissenblatt's got the best TikTok handle at Pod Talk, um, which I think is very cool, um, and she's doing uh, very well on there with. Uh, announcing new uh podcasts and reviews um no i think it's a, a platform that i think the audience is at now i, I, I facebook's dead uh, instagram's going the same way i think snapchat looking at its numbers are, is, is dying on its feet um twitter is a broadcast out medium i think tiktok and video and that short form that they've increased is certainly interesting and i really like this it may not be the right tool it's certainly got the right direction, I think, of making it easier. 
Yes, it does look uh, pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, Gramophone, which I believe is a British um, product as well. So, um, so there we are. Got to the king and all that. Uh, Spotify's Megaphone was down again for a couple of hours earlier on in the week. Um, that's the fourth time that I'm aware that it's been down this year. It's, it was down on September the 2nd, down in early August, and in May it broke for nine whole hours um, I'm not quite sure what's going on at Megaphone, I have to say. Maybe we need to get someone on from there to tell us. I don't know. Yeah, good, yeah, good luck with that. Um, there's a new podcast platform out there called Herd.fm, H-E-A-R-D, although it does have a picture of a cow on the website. It's looking for podcasts to promote in its inaugural creator program. You've until September the 30th if you want to take part in that. And uh, Patreon, rather worryingly, has made its entire security team redundant. Um, my suspicion is that they're outsourcing all of the site's security, which, given that Patreon is essentially just a big payment system, seems a little bit short-sighted but I'm sure they know what they're doing. Maybe they've seen Valley for Valley and just decided to close shop. Who knows? <laughs> now, a few happy birthdays going on this uh, week. I noticed on Twitter, happy birthday to Buzzsprout, which turned 13 years old on the 1st of September. Yes, happy birthday, Buzzsprout. Many congratulations to them. Also, many congratulations to RSS. Long live RSS. Uh, it is um, th- it is RSS's 20th year anniversary next week. Um, so hurrah. It's also my birthday, so I feel very, very happy oh. that RSS and my birthday will celebrate on the same day. Ah, oh, there you go. There you go. You're born <laughs> born to be a podcaster. Well, I feel like it, but I'm not 20. That's the trouble. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it just made me have a look, actually, while I was sort of rummaging around after what David said, was um, RSS 2.0.1 was frozen on July 2003, 19 years ago. That's when it was frozen. Mm. And I thought I'd have a look at the site, and it's, it is just dead. There's nothing been updated on it. And then you look at the people who are involved – now, mm. you might know somebody on the list that's in front of you, James, but I don't know who Roger Cadenhead is. I don't know who Simon Carletti is. I've never heard of these people. Yeah, um, Simone Carletti. But yes, I, uh, 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 Jack Savin, Jason Shellen, I've never heard of any of these people. And in fact, I would be prepared to guess that at least one of these people is dead. So uh, not, not quite sure what's going on. Uh, with that. But I guess, you know, the point is you probably, you know, RSS itself as a standard is frozen. It's the namespaces which are making it exciting and you can still innovate on that. So perhaps it doesn't matter that um, the board members, whoever they are, whoever they were, um, you know, haven't met for a long, long time. But um, yeah, it's a strange old thing. Uh, And the last birthday, um, uh, Brian Barletta, congratulations, sounds profitable, was two years old this week. Yes, many congratulations, Brian, and indeed, Tom. Mm. Now it's time for the Booster, 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 Boostergram Corner. Boostergram Corner. I don't know a thing about crypto. Yes, it's that time again. It's Boostergram Corner, and uh, I have in front of me a ton of exciting boosts. 21,000 boosts from Boomi. Thanks for an always great and very informative show. Helps so much with staying up to date with what is going on out there. Uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, what else do we have? Um, a bunch of uh, additional uh, uh, sats from uh, Boomi as well. Well, um, uh, clearly Boomy is a big fan, so thank you for that. Um, double four, double four sats from Kyrin at Mere Mortals Podcast. The Saturn dashboard is a fantastic first attempt. Highly recommended. Agreed. He also says that um, he has also integrated Saturn into his splits as well. Uh, so now he's got four different wallet setups across his podcasts. Uh, one of the things that I have fed back to the Saturn folk are um, it'd be nice if we could see the name of the podcast and perhaps be able to filter per podcast um, because that would be useful Um, Adam Curry 10,000 sats thank you Adam multiple diva could work on a single reference app oh I think he's talking about multiple devs I'm, I'm gonna guess could work on a single reference app and all be included in a block split. Um, yes, I, I was, we were talking about a reference app uh, last week that might include adaptive podcasting, might include other things as well. Um, 
And uh, I agree. I think that block splits and things like that are a really interesting way of paying uh, a, a lot of different people on one platform. Um, so thank you for that, Adam. And Adam also says that um, Smile, which is the system that uh, the BBC was uh, working on, uh, he said it was weird hearing about Smile. We developed the first freedom controller with it. Bandwidth was the problem and helped me think about enclosures. So there we go. So perhaps Smile is responsible for the invention of the podcast. Uh, if you um, would like to uh, send us a message, then please do. Podnews.net slash new podcast apps is the place to go. Find a podcast app that supports value for value and hit that boost button or indeed just download Fountain because that's a jolly good thing too. Moving on, Event Corner. Steve Pratt has shared details of the lineup for Podcast Day 24 in New York. Uh, you can use the coupon code POD P-O-D-N-1215, which now works for the events in New York, London and Sydney. Now, give me more details, James, because you're involved in this. Oh, yes, I am. Yes. So this is a 24-hour conference, the first eight hours in Sydney, second eight hours in London, the third eight hours in New York. Um, and there's all kinds of people uh, talking there. Let me tell you uh, some of the people who are in Australia. And basically, if you go to one of them, you get to see the other two events on demand afterwards. So basically, it's uh, three uh, different podcast conferences in one. Uh, some of the things going on in Sydney include uh, data from the Australian podcast ranker. There's a session around true crime and why Aussies love true crime podcasts. It's a really interesting um, thing. Grant Tothill, who's the executive head of podcasting for Listener, is talking about how Listener approached the launch of a new podcast. And there's basically a 50-50 rule of uh, not just focusing on the idea, but focusing on other things as well. So he'll be talking about the, f the five rules of success. And if you're interested in uh, a little bit more around narrative podcasts, then Siobhan McHugh uh, is there. She's an author. She wrote The Power of Podcasting, uh, and she's talking about narrative podcasts as well. Um, and um, Tony and Ryan are also there. They're the big signing from um, Spotify this year. Um, so that should all be fun. And then let's peek into the US uh, schedule as well. There's everything from ethics and podcasting, which which Juleka Lantiga Williams is doing. Um, there's uh, Dan Meisner is talking, answering tricky podcast questions with data. Um, so uh, Dan, friend of the show, will be uh, there as well. Uh, Triton Digital uh, will be talking, John Rosso, uh, and a bunch of other people, uh, including Ariel Nissenblatt. Uh, Tom Webster is also um, announcing more from the creators. Uh, which should be interesting. Uh, so if you want uh, tickets for any of that, uh, podcastday24.com is the place to go. And the coupon code is PODN1215. That's PODN1215. And that works wherever you are in the world. I'm so glad you said that nicer than I did. Now, the, the Irish Podcast Awards are going to take place uh, tomorrow, Friday the 16th of September, at the Dublin Liberty Hall. Tickets are still on sale, so... Uh, if you still fancy going, go along. Yes, not happening this year is She Podcast Live, which has shifted to June next year. It'll be in Washington, D.C. Possibly happening this year, Jason Kalkanis, uh, who is um, a venture capitalist and also a podcaster. He's considering hosting a 48-hour event for podcasters only. I'm up for that. That sounds fun. Tell us more, Jason. Uh, that would be a nice thing. Uh, lots more events at pod.events. Jason's very good at doing this. Jason sticks out a feeler uh, yeah. just to see what people's reactions are. And if it's positive, positive, he might push it forward. Um, I, yes. I knew somebody who stuck out a feeler once and then he got arrested. Uh, Castos <laughs> has shared the top 500 podcast search terms on YouTube. If you're interested in finding out what people are searching for and seeing if you can gain the system, uh, then that's a good thing. And there are some people news uh, in here as well. Uh, uh, somebody who I know is Catnap, but sh uh, she's not called that anymore. She's called Catherine Hutchinson because she got married. She's joined Crowd Network as commercial director, joining from ACAST, Jack Ray, Radio and Absolute Radio. Um, iHeartMedia has also named their new chief product officer for iHeartRadio, which I'm who I'm not going to pronounce. I pronounced her name already on the Pod News podcast this week, and I'm not going to dare do it again. And Steve Pratt 
a um, friend of the show, has launched the Creativity Business, which is a business marketing and content strategy company. I had a good long chat with him earlier on uh, in the week. He, of course, used to work at Pacific Content. So what's happening for you this week in Podland, Sam? Well, before we do move on to that, James, um, oh, go on. Uh, Catnap, did you say? Catnap, yes. That was genuinely her name. Right. Uh, well, yes, she might be on name. the show in a couple of weeks' time. Her surname was Nap. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm very aware that they have put her forward for interview. Uh, so we will we will see. Have you said yes to that, Sam? I haven't yet. I, I'm now going to think that you two should interview. I think it would be a funnier interview. That I... <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, yes, it was nice to see her her her, her name again. I, I I saw it about nine months ago when she joined Acast. So um, yeah, she's a good person. And uh, knows what she's doing. Um, so, uh, other than meeting up with with Will and Oscar, what else have you been doing this week? Any large parties or anything? Yeah, no, I'm staying in black. You know, playing morning music and yeah. uh, just you know settling down for the funeral. I guess uh, you know the country uh, rightly so actually to not be so uh, um, blasé is. Um, Mourning a, a queen who, whether you're a monarchist or not a monarchist, she was actually a, a pretty good lady. Um, somebody said, I'll miss not knowing what she thinks. Um, is- <laughs> yes, that's a very good quip. Very good quip. Um, yes, I've been a fan of following some of the Twitter accounts which have been pointing out uh, some of the things in the UK which have been cancelled. Um uh, very uh, sadly, there will be no uh, guinea pig appreciation week next week uh, because of the funeral that has been moved, um, and also, uh, and also, a a bike rack in Norwich has been closed to show respect to the to Queen Elizabeth II. Um, so I'm glad that they're doing that, uh, and I'm glad also that um, both here in Australia and also in the UK, uh, Parliament is off, so that you know any you know uh, crisis or anything else with uh, energy bills, uh, we won't have to worry about that for another two weeks. I'm glad that all, that all of that is uh, happening too. You're you're not planning on on queuing at all. Have you have you been watching the live the live stream? No, not really. No, I mean, yeah. I think I think. The, 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 oh, no, I haven't. I, I think the thing that sort of, um, dips in and out of it is occasional people protesting about not my king and then getting arrested. Um, yes. And I think, yes. I think we're just storing up a, uh, a volume of, um, unrest, which is, oh, yeah, I've, I, I've been seeing tweets from North Korea going, oh, steady on. Um, yes. So what's been happening for me this week? Uh, let's see how much of this stays in the edit. Uh, so what's been, what's been happening, um, for me this week? Um, not, not that much, to be honest with you. I've been, you know, I've been, um, uh, on my way back from, uh, Malaysia last week. Uh, thank you for doing the editing last week. I was uh, very, very tired indeed. Um, I, I've just been, uh, you know, buying more things to do with coffee, um, on the internet this afternoon. That's been my main thing so uh, yes playing around with that and um, that's basically been it but looking forward to taking part at podcast day 24 in a couple of uh, weeks time um, you know still uh, finding that uh, all a little bit stressful but I'm sure it'll all work in the end uh, and that's it for this week if you like this episode of Podland please tell others to visit subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts we'll be back uh, next week with another review and analysis of all things podcasting and of course don't forget that there's a special interview special this Sunday Dino Sophos from Persephonica and Mike Caden from Red Circle mm. you'll find all our previous shows and interviews on our website podland.news and you can give us feedback using the boostergram if your podcast app doesn't support boosts then grab a new app from podnews.net forward slash new podcast apps Yes, and if you like daily news, you should get Pod News, the newsletters free at podnews.net. The podcast can be found in your podcast app or your smart speaker. All the stories we've talked about on Podland today are in the show notes. We use chapters and transcripts too. Our music is from Studio Dragonfly and we're hosted and sponsored by our good friends Buzzsprout and Squadcast. Keep listening. Keep listening.